Hey everybody, Jim Bailey here with Mallet Tech. Thank you for joining us. This is episode one of Mallet Talk, which is aimed at giving you uh, insightful, fun, entertaining discussions with some of the world's industry leaders, musical leaders, leaders of our community. And today is definitely no exception. We have Stefan Harris. Stefan, hello. How you doing? I'm good, Jim. It's good to see you. That's a lot of pressure, though. I'm going to have to be insightful, fun, and entertaining. <laughs> I, I think I think you got it in you. I'm going to pull, I'm going to pull it out of you like a good teacher. <laughs> uh, so tell me, um, uh, how has uh, how has life been treating you the last year? What what have what is all this kind of craziness and madness and uh, you know captivity and interthinking and <laughs> extra time? Um, what is it? What has it done for you? What have you been doing these days? Well, I'll tell you. I'm an observer. So my my entire journey through life has always been predicated upon being able to take a deep breath, observe what's happening around me and make a decision based on what's available. And so when when we went into this quarantine, I did the exact same thing. I didn't panic. I just sort of took a breath, stepped back and said, well, what is what is the opportunity that's in front of me now that would not have been here had we not gone into this quarantine. And I just went full, I went straight ahead with that and just started to, uh, first of all, take advantage like a lot of people did to, to evaluate the pace of life in general, right? In the big picture, yeah. what, have I, what have I been doing for the past 20, 30 years? And is that where I wanna keep going? Do I wanna make adjustments along the way? So that was a fantastic uh, period. Uh, I think the main thing that I did was I just hunkered down. Some people relaxed and I, I got more intense. <laughs> There's so much work uh, that I have to get done that I can't even call it work because I just love what it is that I'm working on and I have so much passion for it. So having the time to not have to work like the way that I work on airplanes mm -hmm. or in hotels to sort of sit at the piano and work out harmony and work on my app. And then ab above all of this, this talk about music has just been able being home with my family. It's just mm -hmm. been a game changer. So I'm actually extremely grateful and appreciative of having had the opportunity to slow down. And uh, also for, for our field to be able to take a pause and to look at what's been going on and reimagine what the future may look like. Yeah. I, I, I dream of a, a day when we can get past, uh, using the word COVID, and we can just call this the Great Reset. <laughs> yeah, you know um, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. I, you know, being in the industry for a long time, and and um, you know, being involved in activities uh, that make you uh, that force you to travel a lot, uh, that force you to be away a lot, away on weekends. It um, this last year for me, I know, has has really kind of put back in perspective how much valuable, uh, how much value there is in my time. Yeah, you know. And it allows you to to think and operate in a in a in a more calm, relaxed kind of focused way. Yeah, and it's also it, it, for me. It's it continues to help me understand the value of music in my life, and it, it's become increasingly clear to me that performing is a part of it, but it's not everything. I love music from the bottom of my soul, and any time that I interact with it, any way that I interact with it, I find a great deal of gratification. So it's been fantastic to have to interact with with music in a completely different way than being on stage. And uh, I don't know if I'd call it a surprise, but I'm, I'm grateful that I, I don't feel like I've missed anything. I've just grown in other areas that in the long run are going to be supplemental to the overall ambition. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that's a that's probably the most optimistic, positive insight uh, into how the last year has been for anybody that I've talked to. So that's that's really cool. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this: as a lover of music, I, I'm a lover of music as well. Have you found that with the time that you have now that you didn't have, let's say, you know, last year, that you um, are consuming music or you have consumed music a little bit differently, or maybe back like when you used to be, you know. Used to be a kid, you lay down, you put your headphones on, you shut the lights out, you just like you just soak up an album. Wow, you know it's funny. I for many years, once I started working on my app, and and you start to deal with algorithms, and you're <laughs> like I'm spending like twelve hours straight working on a tiny, tiny progression over and over again, looking for things. Uh, it kind of burns your musical ear out in a lot of ways. Mm. So I actually don't listen to a whole lot of music, but what has happened 
because I'm spending more and more time with my family because I'm traveling less is I'm getting more exposure to the music my kids are listening to, <laughs> which is great. And my wife, you know, so, I mean, I've heard some really fantastic albums this year that are more on the pop side, like that Beyonce album. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, am I, am I going to be scrolling through TikTok and see you dancing? Is that <laughs> <laughs> not a chance? No, no. I make sure there are no cameras in the room when that happens. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's been it's been more uh, uh, just sort of appreciating music uh, tangentially, uh, and in terms of the way it functions in my family's life. Yeah. But in terms of how I appreciate music, it's it's still right now. I'm just absolutely obsessed with learning. It's That's like awesome. if I, if I had if you gave me the choice to be on the road all year round on all the biggest stages versus sitting at a piano and learning and absorbing more. Uh, deepening my understanding of the science of music, I would definitely choose deepening my understanding of the science of music. Yeah. I, I am um, in talking with some others that the other thing that really have come out of this, I think <clears throat> that I'd love to see kind of percolate to the surface more is people really channeling creativity in a way that they haven't had the opportunity to before. You know, um, I spoke with Ben Galise a few months ago and, uh, you know, I was asking him about how how this whole thing has been, you know, working in his life. He's like, man, I'm, I'm writing and recording all the time, you know, um, so that's, that's fantastic. Cause it's, it's, I went through a thing too, you know, when, when the lockdown happened where, you know, and I think, you know, you hear the stories of like, everybody's making sourdough bread, you know, you can't find like, you can't find flour anywhere. Um, and every, every, every kind of handles it differently. Um, for me, it was like channel creativity. Mm -hmm. you know, like I need to channel creativity. And then I, I also wanted to do some things that were really hands on because I traveled so much before and, and did so much moving around that I felt like sitting in my house was like going to drive me crazy. So I I built <laughs> raised planter bed gardens for my girlfriend and I helped my brother fix his boat. And, it, you know, I recorded a bunch of music and, you know, all that stuff. But it was, you know, I, I'm a different person now uh, for the better. It sounds mm -hmm. like you are, too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's again, it just helped me uh, gain a deeper perspective and understanding of the value of music in my life and understanding that music is not everything, but that it serves to it serves on a on a myriad of levels for me. But one is just sort of an emotional outlet, just yeah. be able to express and get things off of your heart. But then there's that space for the intellectual challenge. And, you know, it's interesting in terms of creativity. And just, since we're talking about this this period, this quarantine period, I got to tell you, I'm not sure that I did much different <laughs> because I basically have been working for many years towards something that's very, very specific. I have 10 year plans, 20 year plans <laughs> like I'm, I'm working really hard and, I, and everything's very programmed out for me. Uh, so what what the main difference is, I was able to take a lot of the extra stuff that I was doing and sort of push that back. So I didn't really have to change what I was working on. I just became more and more focused. Amazing. And I, and again, it's it helped me realize that actually a lot of the other stuff I was doing, I don't really need. I don't I don't miss it. Actually, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> You've like kind of distilled your life. Yeah. <laughs> any uh, before we move on, any any uh hobbies or 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 any like you know did you make sourdough bread did you just learn how to make pizza from scratch you do any of the like the the covid <laughs> i don't know i don't even know what you'd call them <laughs> i mean uh, you, COVID of, hobbies of course i had to binge a couple of shows you know i just finished uh good girls on netflix so just yeah. random shows yeah um but i think for me it's like it's been great to to spend time with my kids more mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I play chess with my older son every day. I just taught them backgammon this past week. So yeah. we're doing things like that. Uh, I, uh, I play basketball with my kids every day. I'm terrible, but, you know, <laughs> I'm a great coach, a terrible player, though. So, <laughs> so just things like that. It's It's been fantastic. Exercising yeah. uh, on a more regular basis, which is fantastic. Just getting used to, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I like to run, <laughs> but I do run. And just being able to have being able to do that on a more consistent basis has been great. Oh, I'll tell you one other thing I did uh, that I did for maybe six months or so is I, I, I tried to be vegan for a while, <laughs> just experimenting with things, just testing my body and learning more things that are really hard to do when you're on the road. It's not impossible, but it's a lot harder. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
I um I was uh I try to get outside a lot, you know. I I love kayaking, so like my therapy, like some people like golfing. I I'm not a much of a golfer. I love the tranquility of the golf course, you know, like you're stuck in the middle of the city, but you're like on this big patch of land where everything's quiet. You're not really hearing planes and car honking, yeah. driving by and all that stuff. But uh, for me, that that tranquility came, um, you know, in, in the kayak and it was it allows it allowed me to reflect a little bit, you know, and kind of clear my mind. So, you know, like I said, I, I think that uh, years from now we'll be calling this the great the great reset. And, uh, and I think it's for the better. And I hope that the people out there watching uh you know we're able to do some things as well to kind of cleanse their cleanse their soul a little bit from all the the hustle bustle that we've been in in 2019 yeah you gotta hopefully your minds are more and more clear and you understand when it all starts to come back you can you can have a little more clarity on what matters <laughs> it's okay to to sort of uh not just accept what life brings to you but to actually dream about what you want and to leave enough space in your life to go after that dream. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I have a 14 year old daughter and I, I was I've been her coach for softball since she started. And, and we do talk a lot about like, you know, the, the reason people are good at things. And it has often little to do with talent and a lot to do with the dedication, the passion, the work that they put into it. Oh, my goodness. It's there's there's it's almost impossible to differentiate between the most gifted people and the hardest working people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you show me an exceptionally gifted person and they probably outworked everyone else. Mm -hmm. well, I'm sure on occasion you have someone who comes along. My my uh, eight year old. I mean, I'm not even anywhere close to him in terms of his ear. <laughs> so he's just gifted. But wow. he also is a hard worker, too. But my goodness. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, a couple shout outs before we move on here. It looks like we got uh, a, a hello from Tom Myers. We got a, we got a hello from Andy Harnsberger. Oh, yeah. a, a hello, Stefan and Jim from uh, Jen Martinez and Mando Percussion says, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice to see you all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And hey, uh, for everybody, um, at any time during the discussion, I'll keep peeking at the chat if you want to. Um, ask a question, a specific question, specifically, you know, about the topics we're talking about. Um, just drop them in the chat. And we'll handle those um, as we see them. Moving on, um, you have mentioned several times um, the importance of education. I am, you know, I'm right there with you. I'm a, I'm a lifelong teacher. I really kind of the what I love most about fatherhood is the fact that I am like I'm her my daughter's live-in teacher. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. so I want to talk with you about education. We had a really really awesome discussion when I first joined Mallet Tech about your kind of your, your philosophy and education. And um, I think it'd be great to kind of just maybe open up that discussion and share it here with some of the people, because I think you've got some really incredibly unique insights um, that I think are worth, worth people hearing. Oh, well, I appreciate it. Well, I mean, I think the, one of the things that's been uh, really inspiring in my life in the past year, uh, I, I, I left Manhattan school and I, I, I joined the program at Rutgers University in Newark. And part of my goal there is to really get an understanding of the general population of students, not musicians. So I'm trying to figure out how to create the experience of how to give the experience of creativity and of making music to people who don't normally play instruments so that we make better doctors and lawyers and thinkers in the world. So that challenge for me has been fascinating. And it's 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 it sort of helped me understand that for us to be successful, for us to build a sustainable career, just like any other field, we have to show our value to society. <laughs> it's not that people owe us anything because we're talented or because we we make nice music, therefore you should buy a ticket. It's not that type of thing at all. Uh, someone who's a chauffeur or a politician, a cook, they all provide something to society that society needs. So I've, I've done a lot of thinking as an educator about what is the service that we can provide as artists, as a community of artists that would demonstrate our overall value and in turn uh, muster up increasing support for our, the sustainability of our field. And I think at the heart of what we do is the beautiful science of empathy. If you think about uh, other fields of study, most fields of study are quantitative, particularly at a collegiate level. You, you really are memorizing lots of information. Of course, there's understanding in other fields. But in the arts, it's such a fascinating thing because it's not always about a lot of material. It's really like, here is this tool. 
there are a thousand things you can do with this tool. But first of all, can you feel it? Mm -hmm. Right. You understand it. Can you actually see it? I'm not going to give you 50 things and tell you to memorize it. Here's one thing that you can make absolute beauty with. But in order to be able to do that, your ability to create beauty is completely predicated upon your ability to understand context. So in the arts, the biggest lesson we teach people in a lot of ways is the ability to sit still, quiet the ego and understand what the people next to you are doing. Before you push an idea forward. Yeah. So what a what a valuable lesson to share with people beyond just the music department. And and I've been I I had a, a class last semester of about 30 students and they were all non-music majors. And it was the most fascinating, creative, inspiring experience I've ever had as a as a musician or as a professor. So I'm I'm kind of obsessed right now with understanding how to really get to the core of what is special about the arts. What is it that we, that's so valuable that we have to offer other people. And when we can identify that, let's start to proliferate uh, that gift to the masses. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing there is that, that compounds exponentially in every direction of music you go, for instance, you know, performance, once you get the instrument and you understand it, you feel it, and you understand the musical concepts and you know what those feel like to you, you still have to be empathetic to know how to perform those in a way that the person on the other side of the stage can feel those as well. You know? That's right. And understand that once, once you have a sense of what it feels like to you, you always have to remain flexible relative to what other people are doing. Yeah. And in, in our field, you can't ignore people. You can, you're not going to make great music that way. <laughs> You can practice, practice, practice a thousand times the same thing, get it together. But once you start to play and you interact with other people, there's something that you're going to have to constantly adjust in the meantime. And that really is one of the most valuable skills for our society is this, this adaptability. When you think about technology and how many disruptive innovations are occurring in the business world, uh, like what makes a good CEO is not going to be about quantitative learning, right? I mean, we have Google for things like that, right? It's really those people who are empathetic, who understand how to be good leaders, who understand how to listen and observe their team and empower people so that they can come together, be creative and create something that AI can't. Yeah. Yeah. AI can remember all the information. If we try to compete with, if we go that route, we're going to lose that battle. But yeah, right we're, now, we're still unique observers as a species and we have to I think put some effort towards uh, empowering people to become better observers, which is what I think we can help to do as artists. Absolutely. Question from the stream. Um, Andy Harnsberger is asking, how do you keep yourself motivated during performances? Hmm. That's a four great performances, question. Four performances. Oh, four performances. Well, you know, the, the, the first, the way you said it the first time is also interesting, you know, because it's during performances, it's really interesting there's no time to not be motivated, right. particularly when you're dealing with improvised music, uh, even when you're playing the melody, although it's written, there's so many things happening in the moment that you you don't have to try to be motivated. You have to just try to pay attention. And as long as you're engaged in paying attention, the world of music is going to be fascinating. The better your ears are, the more you perceive and in terms of staying motivated for performances, I'm not always motivated for performances to give you the real honest answer. I mean, the thing that motivates me most uh, at this point is it's vision. Like there is something that is so clear to me. Oh my goodness, it's been clear to me for decades. And I know exactly what it's supposed to feel like to play. I know exactly what it's supposed to sound like. I can feel it in my fingers. I can feel it in the way, I know what it should feel like to breathe when I'm playing, but I can't do it at the level that I want to, right? So what motivates me is that I can actually see it. Once I can see it, I'm like, man, if I take one step towards it today, great, I'm good. I'm motivated, I accomplished something. I know that I'm not gonna get there in the next week, but I mean, I was up working until five in the morning last night. Like that's a big step. I worked quite a few hours today. That's another big step. So I'm motivated because I know every day I'm, I'm constantly becoming. Yeah, fascinating. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times listening. So I've, um, 
teaching less than I used to. I used to teach a lot. And um, listening is one of those concepts that is difficult for people to teach. It's difficult for kids to understand because unlike, you know, physical technique and motion and the position of your hands and the posture of your body, you can't see it to diagnose it. You can hear it. You know, a good teacher can hear what the student is listening for. But talk a little bit about maybe how you how you teach listening, like some some uh, for those that are online that are um, that are teachers. What are some some things that they can do to, to kind of get their kids really tuned in to have the type of ears necessary to be empathetic when they play? Well, you know, it's one one little joke I like to make with with students is I always say I don't give answers. I take them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Meaning every everything that I teach, uh, it's really designed to pull perspective from the students. So if I get a group of students together and I say, listen to this, do you hear this, this and this? I'm sort of pulling them into my vision and my life experience, which may not be the same for them. So I instead spend a lot of time presenting something and then asking lots of questions and challenging them to look and to perceive. And the way you do it is not through, it's not that you need to be empowered with a bunch of musical techniques in order to be able to perceive. You don't need to know what an interval is to be able to perceive music. You have to be able to access what's already inside of your life experience, already inside of your heart. So generally when I start people out learning to hear music, there's always a direct correlation between a real life experience and the sound that they're hearing. I use uh, visual images. I ask people to paint pictures. If I play this sound, what is if it was a person, what would they be wearing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what time of day is it? Is there a person in your life that it reminds you of? And tell us why, right? And then there's also an element of, of uh, the physicality of sound. Um, uh, listening is... is uh, Wow, it's it's actually pretty active, right? Yeah. It's it's it goes this way, but it also comes back at you. Like you can feel it in your skin. Certain sounds make you uptight. Certain sounds make your entire body relax. So we spend a lot of time tapping into those natural instincts that already exist. And then I sort of I reverse map, right? <laughs> Instead of hitting you with all the complex theory first, I get you to feel first, and then we start to utilize the science, the mechanics of music to explain what it is that you're feeling so you can manipulate it. Yeah. I mean, that's it's, an, it's an active art form. That's the thing that a lot of people don't understand It's you think of listening as passive. Listening takes yeah. a whole lot of work, but I've never experienced anything more valuable than, than growing my ears and learning to perceive. Yeah. You, you just reminded me of one of the concepts, uh, you know, I used to teach middle school and high school. And we used to talk a lot about the difference between active and passive listening. <laughs> That's and, right. and the funny thing is, I, what I would do is I would start talking about it, especially with my middle schoolers. I would start talking about it, and then I would just stop mid sentence, and the room would get quiet, and everybody would tune in like this. And I go, "That's active listening." <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, some things are demonstrative without words. It's powerful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's go a little further down the rabbit hole um, in terms of jazz education. Um, again, we, we have had some conversations in the past about kind of the, the current and future state of jazz education. I think I maybe caught a little bit of those ingredients of your philosophy inside that last um, that last uh, um, um, explanation. But maybe you can you can unpack that a little bit more, a little bit more broadly. Sure. Well, I mean, jazz is, is an amazing art form. Of course, I'm a little biased, <laughs> but uh <laughs> It's interesting because it's been a marginalized art form mm -hmm. uh, for a hundred years. It's, it's never really uh, gotten the, the level of respect for a myriad of reasons. But once it did begin to enter into uh, institutions of higher learning, uh, essentially, I think the the mechanics of the music were let in, but not necessarily the culture. <clears throat> What's really valuable about any art form is the culture. The notes, there's only 12 notes. I mean, my goodness. Again, AI is going to figure out how to organize the notes. AI is going to figure out our culture, though, right? What we bring to the table. So when I look at jazz education, I, I see it as a, a, a platform that's riddled with opportunity for revolution, for change, because that cultural element isn't quite present in the way that I think it could be. Uh, and what I mean by that, for example, is I think once jazz was brought in, it was sort of filtered through a classical musical, classical music theoretical perspective. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the elements that I grew up with in the church, my mother's a minister, 
So growing up in a black church, there's a certain cultural experience <laughs> that you get in terms of the value and the purpose of music. Like music is there to simply to amplify the narrative of the story, right? Someone's talking about a hard time or a good time that they're experiencing in their life. And the music is simply there to intensify that emotion and breed connectivity. So having that cultural perspective and then going to study at institutions, I found that there was a major divide. Yeah. So I see it as a, a, a challenge to figure out how to bring this, this cultural characteristic, particularly of people of color, African-Americans specifically, who were brought here from a, a myriad of countries different religions, different languages, you get brought together and you're sort of forced at this time to create a sense of community that didn't exist. Right. So we ended up having, we ended up creating music that became a platform for disparate voices to come together in a collective way to create beauty. And that's like something when you look at what's happening in our society right now, we're struggling with. We have all these different disparate perspectives. No one's really listening to one another. We're all trying to make our point, but jazz actually, not just jazz, but a lot of the art forms that are derived from uh, our culture is perfectly designed and it, in its DNA is a beautiful lesson about the power of empathy first. The solution to just about all the challenges we face right now, it, they all begin with empathy. It always begins with first quieting the ego and listening. You're not gonna get to a solution that's gonna work for everyone without doing that first. Do so I, I say all that to think about, I know you asked me about education, but I, yeah. I feel like it's all wrapped up in there. Like, what is the purpose of education? It's not just for me to teach you scales. Like, I want to help empower the next generation of interesting, creative thinkers and compassionate human beings who go out here and make a better world for all of us. Yeah, that's, I think that's an excellent point. <clears throat> I, I think about, you know, again, when I was a teacher, I think a lot about the state of education and what I know now versus what I knew when I was a student. And I think it's so it's so performance based. It's so based on, as you said, learning your scales and, and learning, you know, certain pieces and, and um, you know, going through the, the motions of playing a concert, and doing solo and ensemble, that there's a lot there's a, a broader narrative that is lost because you have to play your scale and you have to go do this marching band show and you have to go play this concert. And it's it's very much like it seems kind of systematic. And as a result, a lot of the beauty that people f have when they think about certain types of music, the stories behind it are lost. You know, I, I remember, you know, hearing the stories when I, when I started really getting interested, in, interested enough in drums to start researching why, you know, one of the things is why do jazz players play with an 18 inch bass drum? Why, <laughs> why they do that? Well, the simple answer is that's what could fit in the back of a New York taxi cab. <laughs> that's freaking great. <laughs> that's fantastic. You know, like, you know, it's amazing because that the sound of that drum is so unique. Right. It's beautiful. And it was simply a byproduct of the situation that they were in. They needed to get from point A to point B. They hopped in a cab that you weren't putting a 24 in there. You weren't putting a 22 in there. That's right. Sometimes it's just practical. <laughs> but, you know, the, 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 the great thing is even when you're not trying in a situation like that, the music that's being created is still a reflection of the times. Absolutely. It's a reflection of our circumstances. So 500 years from now, someone listens back to the music and they hear the sound of that bass drum and they wonder why. And what, what they learn is beyond the sound of music. They learn something about transportation, the types mm -hmm. of vehicles that we use and how we move things around. Even though, yeah, back, even though back then trunks were probably so big, you probably could get a 24 in there. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Definitely today, I think people would be playing on 14 inch bass drums. <laughs> yeah. Well, you uh, know, to, 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 to go back to the point you were making about sometimes we lose the story, it's part of the reason I'm, I'm an advocate for public institutions, you know, universities. I mean, conservatories are great. But the idea of going to a public institution, first of all, the cost is considerably less and you won't get bankrupted, which is important. But I, I love the idea of getting a high quality liberal arts education for our next generation of citizens. Like take a class in humanities, <laughs> in literature, in business and understand the, the greater ecosystem that you hope to contribute to. And it will make a difference. Yeah, you know, I think about a scale. And it's funny when you said that we have to learn our scales. While you were saying that, I just was, I got emotional because I'm a sensitive guy, but <laughs> but it's like, I, I was thinking about a scale and I'm like, man, like 
a scale is amazing, not because of the notes, but because you can take an audience like this and you can bring them here and then you can let them go. Like, of course, I want to learn my scales because I want to be able to I want to be able to bring people along and I want to be able to help them relax and intense the intensity. And so, yeah, it's like I'm learning all this information, but it's always connected to how I want to impact other people, not just the science of music. Yeah. So um, hinging on scales, let's talk a little bit about improvisation. <laughs> How just give us give us your 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 one oh one level uh um philosophy on, on improvisation, how you teach again. I I there's there's a reoccurring theme here that builds that I won't be surprised. <laughs> but I'd love for you to kind of talk a little bit more about improvisation. Obviously, it's super, super important to to jazz. I, I think it's important to really any form of music, but uh talk to me a little bit about uh, improvisation, what it means to you, how you teach it. Um maybe even some tips for people that are watching that are having trouble getting kids to learn how to improvise. Well, I mean, it's so, wow. It's, it's funny. I don't think I've ever, I don't think anyone's ever asked me to ask me that question. It's really good. I have to think about it. I mean, I think about uh, some of the most important things to understand is, is that it, it's, it's not quantitative. Again, it's like you can take a simple thing. You don't, become an improviser down the line. It's like, no, no, you can do that right now. Mm -hmm. And the most fundamental skill with improvisation is, is that of perception. It really is about recognizing the opportunities that are happening around you. Now, the other thing I would say is some people who are new to improvisation or observers of, of improvisation think that people are just making it up and winging it. Oh my goodness, that's <laughs> so not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is so much studying that goes into gaining, uh, earning the right to improvise, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so much of it at its best, and I've experienced all sides of it. I've experienced where it's completely ego driven, where I'm on stage and I'm just sort of pushing stuff forward because that's where I am. Mm -hmm. And then I've experienced that higher level uh, where the music really is happening and you hear that this is the next note to play and it creates a reaction in everyone, every, all the other musicians and the people in the audience. But it's not because I was so smart or so talented. It's like, no, no, I heard that Terion was going right here. And for some reason, I could tell that he was slowing down just enough. And all of a sudden, bam, we all just hit it together. But that was really about perception, not something that I was thinking about. But all of that comes through, um, I think, an intense process of study of the mechanics. and. Like I spent one summer, an entire summer, because I'm a little crazy, <laughs> where I was like, you know what? I, I have to earn my notes. Like I, I can play all this stuff. And this is, I had records, I was touring. But I was like, I don't even really know a major scale. Like I can go, but I can run up and down in all 12 keys and all that stuff. But can I actually feel, and if I'm really imaginative and I can hear seven incredible notes, what do they sound like? I spent a whole summer just like, putting on a drone, singing, do, right? And then writing down emotional descriptions and then getting, re, mi, fa, so, le, like understanding the emotional content of every single note. And then just trying to create melodies where all I was doing was just playing the feeling in the note itself. And I started to realize like, man, if you do that, the music makes itself. So it's like a simple thing, like taking a seven note scale and understanding like what well, we talk about, you talked about active and inactive tones, taking a principle like that, there's so much magic to be made in that. Before you, I don't start with bebop, my goodness. Like that's so far down the line. Don't even play a style of music. Just start with the idea of tension and release and emotion. You can play with whatever phrasing you want. You don't have to swing or anything like that. You have to be honest and you gotta be vulnerable and you gotta play from the heart. The rest of it is, I mean, your style will reveal itself mm -hmm. over time. I'm I'm glad you brought up Solfege because um, I know you know we had talked about that. I, I know you've been working uh, quite a bit on Solfege lately. Um, can you share a little bit about kind of the, some of the, you, a little bit you mentioned, but can you talk a little more about some of the other things that you're doing with Solfege and, and how it's helped you? Oh, it's been a game changer <laughs> for me. Uh, I I remember being on the road years ago, and I gave a master class somewhere and. You know, I made a comment to a student and they were like, yeah, man, but I'm just 
I'm just hearing something different. I said, okay, well, can you sing it? And then they, like they couldn't sing it at all. And it's it became really clear. I'm like, well, if you can't sing it, are you really hearing it? Or are you thinking it? Because to think is pushing information this way to hear is to perceive. And if you can perceive it, you can probably sing it. So I remember that moment as a turning point. And I started to ask myself that question. Am I really hearing this or am I just playing a bunch of stuff that I've worked on? Right. You know, I can I can play with feeling and I can I think I can pull it off even if I'm not hearing it. But that's not good enough for me. Right. So that's when I started to I started to say, all right, I'm going to teach myself soulfish. And I'm going to really I, I, I had a, a thing where I was like I had all these exercises I wrote out that I wanted to practice. And I, I refused to touch a vibraphone playing one of these exercises until I could sing it. <laughs> right. Whether it was do me, re fa mi so fa la so, you know, something like that going up in thirds or do mi so la fa re going up in triads up and down. I would not touch it on the vibes until I could sing the whole thing. And, and it that, totally changed it for me. Not that uh, dissimilar from, uh, you know, how you approach tabla. Oh, yeah. 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 You see, you they, they, you won't touch an instrument so you can so you can sing. You know all, all the sounds, and and you're you you reach a level of proficiency um, where you earn the right to play the instrument, which I think is like probably one of the coolest things. <laughs> this is the that's 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 fantastic. I didn't know that, yeah. but see, this is this is one of the great values of of inclusion, cultural inclusion, mm -hmm. right? It's not just about diversity. Like you get people of different races and genders together. What you really want is you want different thought patterns, mm -hmm. right? Because your experience with tabla probably had a completely different impact in your life that you wouldn't have gotten if you brought someone from that culture, but then forced them to sort of adjust to your culture. Like, yeah. no, no, I want to hear people come to the table with their authentic perspective so that I can actually learn and grow. And I think collectively we all become much stronger as a species that way. Absolutely. Yeah. I had a, I had a life changing perspective uh, moment in, uh, I took an ethnomusicology class in college and they brought a tabla player, really good tabla player, in um, who was a kid in our class. I had no idea. Um, you know, I'm sitting back there, and I'm like, okay, what tabla? What's this? Five seconds into it, my jaw's on the ground, and I'm like, what in the world is this thing? And where do I learn about it? <laughs> it was it was amazing. I mean, when you start to look at the the phenomenal legacy in, in Indian culture mm -hmm. in terms of music and rhythm, harmony, melody. How is it that that's not a central part of music education here? Yeah, I, I try to make it. Yeah, I try to make it a part of mine. I taught. Um, I live in Indianapolis, as you know. I, I taught at a little school about eight or ten miles east of the city, like two stoplights, just kind of podunk little school. Love them to death. Um, but uh, I had the opportunity to bring uh, Sandy Berman into my school to do a, a master class for my high schools and middle uh, high school students and middle school students. And you know, the the kids were asking me like, "What? Who's this guy? And what does he do? What's the problem?" I said, "Just." Just listen. Just sit and listen. It'll change your life, I promise you. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. We have a, a, another question here from the stream uh, from Gordon Courtney. Mr. Svon Harris, what experiences, musical or non-musical, shape your perception of music and led you to come up with the science of empathy? Hmm. Well, I, I think uh, my experience in music ever since I was a child uh, created the challenge, right? It, it created the opportunity to grow my ability to listen. Because again, it's one of the only fields of study where we're sitting people down and saying, put this clarinet in your hand, learn this part, but wait a minute, you have to listen to everyone around you. So I think I, I started to learn to listen more deeply as a child because of my music education. But empathy Honestly, for me, I think it, it's, it, it was a survival mechanism. I mean, I grew up in some challenging situations and it was, there was definitely no guarantee that I was gonna make it out because a lot of my friends didn't and neighbors. And I mean, uh, but I do remember trying to figure out saying like, okay, I gotta get out of this situation. I want something better. And I remember just taking the time to observe and say, okay, Someone asked me to do something and I was like, oh man, that's some money, uh, it'd be kind of nice. But then I looked at what happened to other people who went down that road. And so I just, early on, I think I was always in a state where um, I started to recognize patterns around me and figured out that I, I started to be able to predict <laughs> what was gonna work and what wasn't gonna work. Mm -hmm. And so 
the only way that you get to the point where you can sort of chart out your path for the future is again, I keep going back to empathy, but that's what I've dedicated my life to studying and, and uh, enhancing, proliferating in the world. But it's like, once you can see the various parts, then you can see the connections and then you can chart a, a path forward. You actually have lots of options the more you learn to listen. Right, right. If I never play music again, by the way, I mean, I think I love music, but I'd be just as happy proliferating empathy as an educator, as an app developer. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, all, it's all fascinating to me, but it's only fascinating because of uh, the science of listening at the heart of it all. Yeah, I mean that sounds. It's clear that that's your your passion in music. It's music is almost a vehicle for that for you, which is which is incredible. Um, Mr. Lee Howard Stevens has asked you to talk about um, Harmony Cloud, and and Harmony is next on my list. I, I I was thinking we talked about scales. You said you're excited about scales, and I thought the reason you're going to talk talk about being excited about scales is your obsession with Harmony. <laughs> that's okay. Um, Harmony, Harmony Cloud. Talk a little bit about uh, maybe what Harmony Cloud is and what it does for uh, individuals. So Harmony Cloud is is uh, it's an app that I, I created. Uh, the beta is on the market right now. I've been working on an update for quite a while now, uh, which I'm almost finished with. I know I always say that, but I'm, I'm, I'm close. <laughs> it's definitely going to happen in the next few months. Uh, that's what I was doing until five o'clock in the morning, <laughs> working on that thing. Uh, but the the genesis behind it was I was teaching at NYU and I was teaching an ear training class and my students, I'd sit at the piano and I'd play chords and I challenged them. And after, you know, kids would get excited, they were getting better. And then they would say, Professor Harris, how do I practice this? Mm -hmm. And I'd always say, well, you know, we're a family, we're a community. You got to get together with other students. And you see someone in the hall say, come in the practice room, play some chords for me and you challenge one another. And then I realized like that was a whole where there was no tool that existed that was centered around harmony. So I tried, I started to think like, what if I could take what it is that I'm doing at the piano, the way that I'm improvising and create an algorithm that could actually improvise chords to challenge people to be able to hear chord progressions. And so I set out on that journey many, many years ago and never looked back <laughs> and I'm so grateful for it. So basically you can, you can, uh, take any collection of chords that you want. You can start off, you can have, I think there's 70,000 chord progressions in this thing that can happen. <laughs> but you can say, okay, I can't hear 70,000 movements. Harmony Cloud says, well, here's, start with three chords, C, F, and G. And you can see if you can hear the bass note, you can test if you hear the melody note, little by little, and then you can add one more chord, one more chord, and build your ability to uh, hear chord progressions and to create melody. That's just one way <laughs> that it can be used. But you see at the center of that is still empowering people to increase their ability to hear and listen. Yeah, for sure. And where, where can we get that? Right now it's on the Apple App Store. Uh, the update that I'm working on will be for Android. Um, the big, the big uh, uh, addition that's coming, the current version is just triads. And trust me, it's challenging enough. <laughs> it's in, any, in all 12 keys, but I, I now have, uh, 13, sharp nine, sharp 11s, like essentially, I mean, I, I would dare say probably 95% of the chords in Western Harmony are going to be in this update. That's so it's, it's close. <laughs> working, but get some sleep, all right? <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that. I used to sleep years ago. <laughs> it's not work though, man. It's not work. I'm so, I'm so energized. I, I literally, it's like the past three weeks, Jim, I've been studying augmented triads <laughs> like three weeks just on a triad. But I, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where I'm so curious about it. I'm so fascinated. And I, I, I just learned things that I couldn't find it in any book and I couldn't find an explanation online at all. And so I just, I refused to let go of the question and I started picking at it. And now I have a, a, a pretty thorough understanding of what an augmented triad is. How do you play on it? How do they function in terms of progressions? And so it's it's an obsession. <laughs> it's a healthy obsession, though. Of course. Of <laughs> course. <laughs> um, so for those that are online, you know, we've got people that are uh, probably hobbyists. We also have probably individuals that are, you know, career musicians and, and aspiring career musicians. 
um, shifting away from kind of the, the deep theoretical into maybe something a little bit more lifestyle-y. Um, what are some, adv- what's some advice that you'd give, maybe some early lessons that you learned about developing your career, building your career, maximizing your career? Yeah. You know, one of the, the most important lessons is something I mentioned earlier for, for aspiring artists is just understand that you're not special. <laughs> like understand that you have to provide a service and you're just going to have, you're going to have to wrap your head around that. All of us provide a service. If it's about making money, if it's just about art and of itself, then you make art for yourself. Mm-hmm. But if you expect people to pay money, you need to understand where people are in their lives and you need to, you need to provide a service to them. Now, here's the thing. I'm not suggesting that one, uh, takes a look at the world and says, okay, I'm going to create music for this group of people. What I'm suggesting is that you authentically create from your heart, but understand that none of us are an island. (laughs) We're not so unique. We like to think that we're individuals and so special and unique, but we're not. There are lots of people like me. There are lots of people like you in the world, right? Not exactly like you or me, but we have enough in common that if we create from our heart, given all of the years, the decades of life experience, in developing the skills necessary to articulate ourselves. If we articulate what's in our heart, we're clearly going to be articulating what's in the hearts and minds of lots of people who don't have the ability to sing their story, to tell their truth. So a lot of people are bottled up. They feel exactly what we feel, but they don't know how to write the poem. They don't know how to do the dance. They don't know how to write the song. It's our job to do that so that we empower those other people. So I say create from the heart And as an entrepreneur, once you create from the heart, what you want to do is take your product and then you want to look around in the world and see where is that needed. As opposed to, oh, I see a need over here. I'm going to go after that. I think most people who are really, really successful, they all have that passion, that obsession. Like, I think I have a lot. I have a serious Mm -hmm. obsession and it doesn't matter how long I'm not going to stop until I answer these questions. But then I, I, it's, it makes sense to me in what I'm working on. I can understand where the population of people are that will need the product, uh, products that I'm creating. Yeah. That's, you know, one of the things I think it's really cool in the last, uh, let's say, let's say 10 to 15 years is that colleges, <clears throat> which is obviously populating the world with a lot of, a lot of artists, and a lot of musicians are starting to incorporate, um, entrepreneurial classes in, as part of the curriculum. So mm-hmm. because it's an important it, it's an important aspect, you know, to what what you're talking about at the most basic level is an assessment of of the market or the assessment of the you know, um your area of competition. What makes you unique? What else is out there, you know, and and how do you find your place in that? And mm-hmm. I think I think that's really really important because um we have a lot more independent musicians today than I think we've ever had and and part of that's because we have the technology that uh, has broken down the the barriers where, you know, um, musicians used to have to rely on record labels and, and and you know big corporations to to get them success when now they can create their own success. Um, That's right. Yeah, but the the idea of, of being an entrepreneur, I think, is is one of the most important things if if you want to have a successful, fruitful career in music. Yeah, and and the other part of it, I mean. If you look at a lot of really successful people, if you're chasing after someone else's dream, you're going to lose. You you can't you can't be Lee Howard Stevens. I can't be Lee Howard Stevens. That dude is just from another planet. I mean, I I, I as a little kid, I just remember sort of not only his playing, but then I remember I had his bag, I had his mallets, the book. Like he clearly had a big picture vision that was about music, but also about business. But if I tried to chase after what it is that he built, there's no way I could compete with him. So instead, I think we all, it's incumbent upon all of us to have enough self-confidence and belief in ourselves that we capture what's unique about us and move forward with that. And then you never compete. And you also get beyond this this, uh, insurmountable challenge of, of levels right? Who's the best? And it's not about that. <laughs> like in the, the real task, and I think this is clear with jazz in particular, it's about who's the most authentic. Mm-hmm. It's not about who's the fastest or the, like that doesn't always connect with other human beings. So just really be yourself. And you know, the other thing, the other advice I would, I would give in terms of business is understand that you don't, you don't have to have all the answers. Right? <laughs> I don't know anyone who knows everything. So 
understand how to seek help, like have the humility to say and clarity to say, I'm really, really good at this. Mm -hmm. I don't know this other side. Develop a network so you can reach out and uh, build a team uh, of people who have shared vision and shared passion so you can move forward together. Yeah, I, I've had a, you know, being in the music industry for about 15 years now, I've had the uh, the privilege of being able to work with a lot of my heroes that I grew up listening to and idolizing. And one of the things that you, the point that you just made has kind of sparked this thought for me. One of my early observations was how how curious and how almost student like some of my heroes were. Uh, <laughs> I have a really crazy story about Harvey Mason that I'll tell um, really quickly. Um, 2007, I was at drum, I was at uh, DCI in in, uh, in LA at the Rose Bowl, and my boss at the time told me, you know, go to the Rose Bowl and give this guy two tickets. And I'm like, who am I giving two tickets to? And they go, Harvey Mason. I'm like, no, not like not Harvey Mason, not like Headhunters Harvey Mason. Like, you know, no. Well, I met up with him, and it was him. Mm -hmm. Even the I gave him the tickets. I go, Harvey, why? why are you at a drum corps show? Like, you know, and he explained that he really enjoyed drum corps and, and uh, he actually had done some marching, you know, back in the day. And he goes, well, what, you know, what, what brought you here? And I said, well, I, I work for the company. And I said, you know, I used to, I used to teach drum corps back in the day. And he goes, well, who'd you teach? I told him, I, I, I used to teach the, the Cavaliers. And he goes, can I take a lesson from you? <laughs> it took everything. It took every fiber of my being not to like laugh because <laughs> what, in the world am I going to be able to teach you? But, and then I had not that type of experience, but I had similar experiences where I saw people getting really curious. Either they're asking each other, you know, the community in, in, in which, you know, one hero asking another hero something, wow, okay, that's cool. But not afraid to ask somebody like me that could be seen as like a lowly, you know, uh, corporate person or whatever. I, I just, I, that is really fascinating um, because it, but it's also reassuring that that's, that's why they got to where they are because they ask a ton of questions and because they're, they're, you know, infinitely curious. And, and again, it's this thing of like, it's no one could ever play like Harvey Mason. Like he has a total original sound. Is it better or worse than other? I don't know. I don't think of it that way. And it doesn't sound that way to me. Yeah. So it, it doesn't surprise me that someone like that, would have the clarity to understand that there's great benefits in, in approaching and learning from all types of people. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a, 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 a similar story is the great James Moody. Oh my goodness. The, the, the saxophonist. Yeah. I, know I was doing a thing years ago in, in uh, the Bay area and it was, it was James Moody and Curtis Fuller, uh, Cedar Walton, Billy Higgins. I mean, it's like an incredible band and in little old me. And so, <laughs> <laughs> We're backstage, and man, uh, James Moody was just always practicing, always. But he'd be over in the corner, and he'd say, hey, Stefan, come here, come here, come here. What do you think of this? And he'd have something he was writing, and then can you show me this or that? And the same thing, I'm like, you're James Moody. What are you talking about? And what do you think of this, and how would you approach this? So it's, it's not surprising to me at all that people of that caliber are constantly becoming and, and just just because it's the, one of the great blessings of being in the arts is you get to be around real genius. Right. I mean, it's I got to play with Max Roach and people like that. I mean, these people were otherworldly. Uh, but James Moody, that on that same gig, uh, James was on his phone all the time. His wife is sitting in the audience. We're backstage getting ready to go on. And he's, honey, just, you know, do you want me to send some water over to the table? Do you want anything? I can order some. Just constantly, right? And and then eventually he's like, uh, hey, Stefan, come here. I don't think I have your number. So, you, you know, he he, uh, he says, give me the phone. He uh, takes out his phone. He says, give me your number. So I start telling him my number. My, he's like, I want your home number. So he starts dialing it in. And I'm like, okay, cool. James Moody's going to have my number. And he goes like this. And he hands me the phone and the phone is ringing. And then my wife answers and he says, tell your wife you love her. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this is the type of guy he was just all love and just yeah. sort of that's like a grown up lesson. Like just be connected with other human beings and be grateful and appreciative. Empathy. Right? Just interesting people out here in the world. <laughs> yeah. um, last uh, lastly, we're, we're um, we I think we can go another hour if we want to. But I know you got to get moving. Um, <laughs> Striking a balance, uh, you know, another aspect of being a being a good musician, being a good uh, uh, career musician or good artist, good 
good dad, good husband. How uh, would you recommend people strike a balance? How do you find your balance, especially because you have so much passion and so much energy? Uh, what what is what do you do to kind of keep everything centered? You know, it's a funny thing. It's like I, I was thinking about that this week. And you know what I struggle with? I struggle with not struggling. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is I'm not the most balanced person, but I love it. Like it's not work. Like I have to figure this thing out, whether I make money doing it or not. So I get so much joy and passion in what it is that I'm doing that I, I don't feel like I need to not do it when I'm doing it. So it's a hundred percent. So what's helped me over the years is I've learned to be really good at compartmentalizing. So the same level of intensity I have with music and learning when I'm with my boys or my wife, I mean, I'm I'm there like a hundred percent all out. Let's do it. Whatever it is that we're going to do, I'm completely committed. But I had to sort of accept that uh, about myself that I, I don't know. I'm driven. There's there's a certain kind of thing that I'm looking for. Um, I hope I never get it because <laughs> you know? I love the journey and I'm just I'm growing and I'm so appreciative. And I also look at my boys and uh I understand that they're learning about life from observing me and, and knowing that dad really loves and cares about something, this, this science, and then I'm taking this science and I'm trying to help other people with it. So I think it's a good balance as long as, of course, I, I spend time with my family as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I'm sure people on the, on the stream can relate to that. I, I know for me, um, I've caught myself in moments where I'm with my daughter and, but I wasn't really there, you know, yeah. and I'm yeah. like, uh, it kind of just, uh, that whole interaction felt a little hazy to me, you know? Um, and again, for me, the, the COVID thing I think is really, is really helped that because it has slowed everything and everybody down, you know, almost sometimes to a, to a grinding halt. Um, but it allows you to have, you know, really intense, memorable moments with, you know, your family, your wife, your, you know, whoever. Um, and I think that's really, really important because uh, life is going to continue to move faster. Yeah. yeah. We're not going to have less technology in five years. We're going to have more. There's going to be more ways for people to contact you and me than there was last year. <laughs> and that's a scary thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, honestly, I mean, we got to do, we have to learn to do it all on our, on our own terms and, and the, the issue as, you, as you're raising with more and more technology, it's I think it all comes back to being a good observer, understanding where you fit in all of it, and knowing that technology could be an incredible tool if you understand how you want to utilize it. Right. Don't like it's funny. I'm not a I know I'm supposed to be, but I'm just not a social media person. And I, I don't really I love people. I love helping. But it's one of those things like I have so much work to do. I just I don't have time to do a whole lot of social media. But when I do show up, it, I'm 100% there. I give everything I possibly can from the bottom of my heart to, to anybody who is is open to it and 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 anybody that I think I can help, I do the best I can. Yeah, you, you've <laughs> certainly done that here, man. You've lived up to the bill. <laughs> oh, appreciate that. Um, so on that note, we're gonna, we're gonna conclude. Um, for anybody that's watching, um, keep in mind, this is gonna be something that we're gonna do monthly. We got a really, really killer um, lineup for the next uh, several months. So um, April, uh, we've got uh, Valerie Naranjo, who's a fantastic marimbist. She's actually going to join the uh, the Lee Howard Stevens Summer Seminar uh, this summer, but we'll be talking about uh, things that go well beyond that. Um, May is going to be really interesting and cool, too. Uh, Tony Maselli kind of brought a concept to me of, of having this. Uh, he calls it woodchuckers versus metalheads. Um, and, uh, you know, basically marimba players and vibe players. And I said, well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to pit those two against each other, but maybe we can talk about some stuff where like somebody that is maybe more marimba centric versus somebody that's more vibe centric. How would, how do we think about these things? What, what are the, what are the commonalities? What does that Venn diagram look like? Hmm. That'll be an interesting one. In June, we have the, uh, the fantastic Warren Wolf. Um, he'll be, he'll be great to talk to. And then in July we have, um, Aaron Williams is a new, fantastic, um, marimba player, multi-talented performer, um, and, uh, and plenty more after that. So every month we're doing it usually on Tuesday nights. Um, but uh, Stefan, I want to really thank you. This has been an absolutely fantastic way to kick this entire thing off. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And, uh, I know that, uh, 
those that joined us just got a, a ton of awesome, inspiring information, which is exactly the goal of this whole thing. So thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for having me and to everyone out there who's listening, uh, understand you're, you're gathering some really, really powerful tools, but you're not necessarily gathering the purpose. So understand you can use these pools for these tools for a myriad of things, but please as percussionists, oh my goodness, we have the unique ability to put instruments in the hands of people who've never touched them before and get them started in the music experience early. Be generous with your gifts and uh, it's gonna it's gonna pay back. It's gonna give us all more strength in the long run. So thank you all. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye-bye.